we're going to get started. Um, welcome everybody to the third annual Harvard Law School Blockchain and Fintech Initiative Conference. I am very excited today to be moderating this panel on taking down terrorists in cyberspace. We have three great panelists, um, Judge Zia Faruqi, who is a former um, assistant U.S. attorney, current United States Magistrate Judge, Chris Jenzuski from the IRS, and Kyle Armstrong from the FBI. And so the three of them have prepared little presentation with a couple of case studies, and then we will have time for some audience questions after that. So I'm, it seems like you have your bios and introductions kind of baked into this panel or into the slideshow. So do you want to do it that way or we can do it now? Yeah, it sounds great. We can kind of introduce ourselves and then kind of explain where, uh, what our agencies oversee. Okay, great. Go great. For it. I'll, I'll start. Wonderful. So uh, this is amazing. We've made it, boys. Harvard Law School. I'm now going to start every conversation I ever have at every, any dinner party with me. Oh, yeah, I was recruited by Harvard Law. No big deal. I'm sure you wouldn't have heard of it. <clears throat> and I will leave out the details where it has nothing to do with actually attending the school, but purely for us to uh, sit and kind of share our war stories for about an hour. So as you can see here on this screen, this is what we affectionately refer to as a splash page. And you can see it says the, this domain has been seized and the beautiful logos and badge seals from each of our respective agencies. This has to do with what we'll talk about and how we were involved in um, the cyber enabled terrorist financing investigations of three different terrorist organizations. Judge, go ahead. So Great. as Maud said, I'm Chris Jancheski, Kyle Armstrong from the FBI and Magistrate Judge Zia Faruqi, formerly when we uh, were conducting these investigations, he was the lead prosecutor on these investigations. And so I'll leave it to Magistrate Judge Faruqi to kind of talk about the U.S. Attorney's Office, where he was at previously, how it kind of fit into this story and so forth. So please. Thanks so much. <clears throat> and uh, as you saw, we had another badge on that uh, front page and which was from Homeland Security. So uh, Homeland Security's team in Philadelphia, read by Ryan Landers, uh, along with Bill Capra and several folks out there, Tom Check. Um, really also key part of the team here. Um, a lot of other prosecutors as well. I was certainly not the only one. Jesse Brooks um, from the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, we were, was my teammate uh, on the case back when I was at the U.S. Attorney's Office. So uh, just a little bit of background on myself. I was previously uh, at the U.S. Attorney's Office until September of this past year uh, when I came to be a magistrate judge, um, speaking only here in my personal capacity and about this uh, previous case. Uh, when I was there, I was uh, helped to find the threat finance unit, which U.S. Attorney Jesse Liu started. Um, you know, when there, we uh, had a broad remit. We were looking for the nexus of uh, national security and cybercrime to financial investigations. Uh, so we worked on recovering stolen antiquities looted by ISIS, uh, seizing tankers on the high sea, uh, as well as enforcing North Korean sanctions. Uh, you know, it was in large part thanks to the incredible work of the agents who I was working with at that time, who obviously you're going to hear from a couple of them today. Uh, but we really were trying to find new ways to disrupt uh, criminal action and not just looking at uh, criminal penalties, but using civil tools. Um, you know, in, uh, you'll hear from today uh, how we used not only civil tools, but in the intersection of uh, undercover operations uh, to leverage those civil authorities to disrupt um, foreign crime that is occurring and targets people in the United States, but is largely based out of uh, extraterritorial conduct. So uh, with that, I'll hand back to Chris. Thank you. So yes, I work for Internal Revenue Service Criminal Investigation. Many people are aware that there's of the IRS, especially this time of year, when you are hopefully looking for a refund um, to drop into your bank account anytime soon. And more specifically, there is the criminal investigation side. So we are special agents, much like my Kyle, colleague Kyle at the FBI and others at HSI, DEA. We focus on criminal investigations uh, to you know, ultimately arrest people, charge them with crimes and bring them to court. So, and more specifically, our group focuses on cyber crimes. And fortunately we've been involved in a handful of uh, investigations that you may be aware of to include Welcome to Video, which was the largest was the takedown of the largest darknet child 
exploitation website followed by dark scandals. Um, recently, there was the Twitter hack investigation. Uh, recently, another member of my group seized over a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. You can read from some of the other cases we've been involved in too. So generally, we're just looking for an impactful case that has some type of financial component. And generally, cryptocurrency is going to be kind of our nexus of how we find that financial component, which is kind of led to a very broad uh, portfolio of investigations. So next, I'll turn it over to Kyle to speak about everybody's favorite, the FBI. Of course, we talk about cases. Kyle wants to talk about movies. Why wouldn't he? Well, um, thank you all for having us and uh, uh, for Chris and Judge Faruqi putting this together. Um, you may not know, but these are documentaries based loosely on um, some of my work as a surfing FBI agent, uh, a new agent out of the academy who got to interview um, uh, serial killers and a, a hunky agent up in Boston going after bank robbers. So my unit now, unfortunately, not nearly as fun, um, unless I get to work with uh, some of the best uh, folks in the U.S. government like Chris and uh, Judge Faruqi. Uh, we are in a terrorism financing unit, and so our primary goal is to uh, identify and hopefully mitigate uh, terrorist actors using financial intelligence and actionable financial intelligence. And so a lot of what we do is work with uh, private sector, work with our USIC partners, and then try and get it to law enforcement partners uh, and law enforcement agents, FBI agents, to work with the great folks at HSI, DEA, um, but particularly Chris and Judge Faruqi and their shop because they're the best in the world at this stuff. And so uh, I was lucky enough uh, to work with them on this, and we dearly miss Judge Faruqi. Um, and so we are our our whole goal is to find cases, get them opened, and get uh, uh, get some sort of disruption using either federal criminal law or civil law. And so that's what we were able to do on these three cases. And just to point out something that Kyle said, U6 stands for United States Intelligence Community uh, that he works with quite a bit as well. Okay, so the whole reason that we're here, as mentioned, we the Department of Justice announced this past summer the disruption of three different terrorism financing campaigns. Uh, the first one we'll speak about is the Hamas Al Qassam Brigades. That is the Al Qassam Brigades is the military wing of Hamas, a designated entity by the United States and other countries. And how this whole thing kind of came about was in uh, about January 2020, Hamas had made a tweet on their official Twitter account, and they were not shy about what exactly this tweet was. They tweeted out a Bitcoin address asking for donations for the Palestinian resistance. And if you were kind of not exactly sure what that meant, they had these beautiful graphics to go along with it of weaponry and other things showing what they intended to spend those, that money on. And we kind of break down this fundraising campaign into three different stages. Uh, so this was stage one where they just tweeted out this one single address and uh, not to get too uh, kind of wonky on Bitcoin, but basically this address was hosted at a US based exchange, meaning it's similar to like a Bank of America bank account, right? So it might be your funds at this bank, uh, but ultimately you have to go to Bank of America and say, may I have my funds that I'm entitled to? So if the banks close, it might be your money, but you still have to abide by that bank's terms to get your money out, generally speaking, as was the case with this address. So um, that as you can imagine, did not go very well for them. It got a lot of attention. People are able to see this address because Bitcoin takes place, all the transactions on a public ledger, everybody could see all of the money coming in and researchers were paying attention to it. And of course, us within the law enforcement community were paying to attention to it as well. So that fell through because what did the US base exchange do? They closed the account. So I think there were 25 or 50 donations or so that went in and the exchange uh, froze the account and we, the United States government, came back in behind it and seized those funds, as we'll talk about later. Those funds ultimately will go to the Victims of Terrorism Fund. I'll let Zia speak about that in a moment. But the stage two campaign, um, they thought, well, it didn't work very well the first time. Let's try this again for stage two. So this time they tweeted out 
Another address you can see it on the right. Again, very clear what they intended to do with those funds. Instead of being at a US-based exchange, this was an unhosted wallet. So think of it like their own computer that they control that much like now your money's sitting at your house. Like you are in control of it. Uh, you own it, but you also control it, right? But again, it was just one address, right? So that made it very easy for people to watch. And since it wasn't going to an exchange, they could also see where those funds were going after the fact, meaning like who are the facilitators laundering these funds on behalf of this designated terrorist entity. So again, not necessarily the best way. I think it's uh, two things to just jump in here and point out, um, particularly for the audience thinking about blockchain uh, sort of technology and what does it mean? Uh, look, that you know, th this was something that if, if someone was using cash or they were using a bank account, uh, pretty unlikely that they, the government, we would have at that time, the investigators, they would have been able to follow the money, so to speak, right? Because um, when people send money to or from a bank account uh, or when someone hands somebody cash, there's not a publicly available ledger to see that. Um, so you see here, you know, the address that's down there at the bottom, the 17 QAW, uh, you know, you could, you not only are looking then on the public blockchain, you can see everyone where that address is sending money to, but obviously Chris and his colleagues, Kyle, Ryan, folks, and they were using analytic software um, like Chainalysis, uh, that they, they would then follow the money, right? So they'd also see, well, who is sending the money uh, to that address? Um, you know, and so that that's why you see uh, we've talked about, I think, uh, in other cases, other presentations, Chainalysis, TRM Labs, Elliptic, there's all sorts of different software programs that you can use. Um, but as uh, Chris always says, you know, I, I like the analogy, it's like math, you can do it by hand, long math, you know, long division or whatever on the paper, or you can use tools like a calculator. And the blockchain just makes it so easy, right? You can follow the money in and out, and it makes it, in fact, very traceable. Yeah, one of the questions that we routinely get asked is, you know, is it bad that they're going to cryptocurrency? Are you concerned that terrorists are pivoting into this arena? And, you know, for oftentimes it makes it easier, right? I can sit in my basement, uh, hiding away from my children, and drink as much coffee as I want and follow all the money as it's moving, right? Because it's on a blockchain, it's public. Whereas if it was a hand-to-hand -hand cash transfer in Syria, uh, much less likely that I'll be there to witness that event and be able to track those funds. You never know though, I might be there. <laughs> okay, so stage two and then it pivoted to stage three. And stage three uh, is where it became more complex. And it, this is kind of like a real time uh, evolution of this, of this scheme. And that's pretty interesting, I think, to just to see how quickly it started as like trying to feel out what they were doing. And now it pivoted to a much more kind of complex cryptocurrency fundraising campaign. And so in this instance, they would direct people to their website, the alkasam.net. And, you know, you don't have to be able to read the language to be able to see the Bitcoin logo and then also the QR code. And if you were to click on that, it would bring up alkasam.net uh, again, and then this payment um, page. And there's a couple of things on here. One, you can see at the top, it's in five different languages. You could check the different language. So clearly they're trying to have a real kind of world approach here, not just like a local one, maybe country or language. Two, there's a video here that you would click it and it actually explains how the various steps that they wanted you to go through to kind of launder and layer the funds to get it to them. And it talked about go to an exchange and they listed various ones and then move it to an unhosted wallet. Like we just kind of talked about briefly and then send it to us, make it more convoluted to send the money. So law enforcement, others cannot track it as easily. And another thing that really kind of stepped this up was that before we talked about just having the one address, again, be on a public ledger, everybody could follow that one address. You could set up alerts anytime money goes into it, you could get an alert and know that like, oh, there's activity. We should go check this out. Now they pivoted, so you have to type in a recaptcha so it wasn't automated. You had to select, you know, the taxis, much like everybody hates doing every time they're trying to do something on the internet. And then it would generate a new unused Bitcoin address and it would instruct you to like, you can use this address once or twice, but don't keep using it. If you want to resend, get a new address, make it much more difficult. And of course that does add more challenges and we have to evolve with the threat and try and figure out how to circumvent that. And lastly, about this page, you'll notice that there is the fund at alkasam.ps email address. So, you know, if you're having issues, 
or you just kind of like want to feel this out, whether donating to terrorism is something you want to get involved in, here's an email address. You can kind of explore the waters with that as well. So randomly, there was this uh, warning that al Qassam brigades put on their Telegram and Twitter account. It said, out of control, Zia or Kyle, do you have any idea why al Qassam brigades would want to put out there that there is uh, an issue with their domains? Yeah, so that's the great thing, of course, about having uh, uh, great prosecutors and uh, great investigators to work with is uh, performing seizures. And so one thing, and I think we'll hit on this towards the end, but uh, for you future uh, DOJ employees, uh, very high level folks, um, being practical goes a long way. And so that's what uh, Judge Faruqi and his team as prosecutors are, are often able to do, uh, was look at a situation in more than one way, instead of just trying to do the traditional route of finding folks indicting them criminally, which means we're going to try and arrest them, but they're going, they live in areas which we don't have uh, access to. Let's try and look at civil forfeiture and using the civil forfeiture code to make disruptions. And so that's what uh, uh, Judge Faruqi was able to help and his team were able to help do. And so we were able to seize some of these websites, which I'm sure we'll jump into. Yes, yeah, do you want to kind of start with some of the enforcement actions that we filed through with? Sure, yeah, so uh, what we were able to do, as you'll see there, there were search warrants for 60, uh, over 60 email accounts of people who donated. Uh, part of when you open up a uh, virtual currency account at a cryptocurrency exchange, you know, they do what's called Know Your Customer, KYC. Uh, and as part of that, you're typically giving an email address, you're giving maybe a selfie with like your driver's license or passport. Uh, they frequently, you know, the better exchanges will ask for more information. They'll ask for you to hold up like, you know, also a uh, passphrase or something like that that's generated at that time. Um, so you see here that there were email accounts, uh, search warrants lawfully authorized by uh, independent neutral judges of third party money launderers, administrators of the site and donors, um, but there were seizure warrants. So 12 at financial institutions and at 127 unhosted wallets. Uh, so that means that there were warrants again approved by a neutral uh, judge uh, to authorize after finding probable cause that these accounts were subject to forfeiture. Uh, there's been a lot of litigation in, in the DC courts about the broad expanse of the forfeiture authority for terrorism cases, you know, that you get everything. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, quote unquote tainted or not. Uh, there's still, of course, Eighth Amendment analysis. I'm sure uh, everyone's taken con law, hopefully now at, at, uh, in law school, but, um, you know, that comes in the back end, not in the front end. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, what you know, Kyle was uh, touched upon, there was 11 search and seizure warrants related to the web website infrastructure. And so what happened was that law enforcement using legal tools, uh, you know, they did what's called a, a website seizure and it was covert. Uh, so they went and Kyle and Chris and the, uh, Ryan and uh, Bill, the team, they actually took over the al Qassam uh, website and started operating it. So when people, you know, think about getting catfished uh, and things that you see uh, back in the day when people used to watch on MTV, um, people were going and writing into terrorists and you know, this website saying like, I want to fund terrorism. I, you know, I want to do X, Y, and Z. I want to kill people, things like this. Um, but in fact, it was Chris, Kyle, uh, you know, Ryan and Bill and the other folks on the other side um, reading these conversations. Uh, and when they were donating money, uh, the money was actually going then uh, directly instead of to fund terrorism, but to fund the victims of terrorism. There's a, a statutorily created fund uh, that uh, victims of terrorism who have outstanding judgments can draw from. Uh, and so, they were actually, uh, the US government was actually funding this through people making donations and you know they had no idea. Um, there was one clue someone picked up on, hypothetically maybe, that there was perhaps a, a Rickroll link that got put onto the new website. <clears throat> maybe rumor, I don't know, there's some news stories about it. You'll have to do your own research. I'm sure all the talented law students at Harvard will be good about uh, tracking that down. You know how coding um, just have those mistakes sometimes. <laughs> um, and so you see here the different websites, uh, also the things that were done, you know, they're um, Treasury Department, there was a lot of collaboration with them. They remove website certificates so that, uh, uh, you know, it's not like you just go get another cert from somewhere else. Uh, you know, those are from like three or four generally reliable companies provide that. Once that those get pulled because there's a designated terrorist organization, so no U.S. authority or um, company could provide services to them, uh, it makes it very hard for your, you know, most browsers will not go, like Mozilla, Chrome, uh, 
Internet Explorer, or whatever, you know, they, they won't go to those websites that don't have certificates. And so, um, you know, there was a lot of different things that people were able to do to take down this um, site, again, all lawfully authorized by um, uh, seizure warrants from a judge. Yeah, I think this is a real testament to the team and kind of the collaboration of each of the members from the respective agencies bringing together their backgrounds, ideas, but also some of the tools that they have at their disposal. If you think of like a traditional criminal investigation, you're focused on bad guy one, you build a case, you go arrest bad guy one and like, okay, now we're done. We move on to number two or whatever. Uh, and this one, it was very much a more proactive approach. Of we wanted to seize assets to be able to uh, hurt them financially. We also wanted to take down the infrastructure so we could prevent them from kind of just like re-spinning it up. You know, what's uh, the point of, you know, arresting the people within a, say, a drug house if they can just go right back into that same drug house and start redistributing, right? We wanted to take out the infrastructure to make it harder to build up again. But also, like you're on the internet and there's the famous cartoon of like on the internet, nobody knows I'm a dog, right? Well, how do you know someone's actually a terrorist? Potentially, in this case, it could have been the U.S. government, right? So the we want to sow some distrust within the community and make people think twice about when I hit send to send Bitcoin to uh, uh, an enemy of the United States, is that actually going to be who I think it's going to be? Or is it going to be the U.S. government? And are my funds then going to go into the victim of terrorism fund, like the exact opposite of what that person's intending to do? I think that was Eric asked a question exactly along those lines uh, in the chat. Um, is why not put up fake posts uh, like this in the future? And, and the answer is, who knows? Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Um, so, um, you know, exactly to Chris and Kyle's point, um, you know, you don't know, right? No one knows what's on the other side of the internet. Um, and so that is something that presumably when you think about deterrence, that's something that could be used. Um, also the answer, there was a question from another attendee. Um, I'll leave to Chris and Kyle to answer the privacy coin questions, but, um, you know, why would terrorists do this if it makes it easier to interdict? I mean, that, that's a common question, you know, is like, why do people turn to devices or mechanisms that actually may end up even on the short term seem more secure, the long term not? The answer is hard to say, you know, people just may not know. Um, certainly, you'll see in the Al Qaeda case as it comes up, um, people became just a lot more liberal in what they thought they could do. Their OPSEC went down in some ways because they thought um, they were on encrypted platforms that were completely private. And so, um, you know, you only catch people when you, they let their guard down. Um, but, you know, as you saw from Chris going through these three stages, you know, th there's evolution, there's adaptation that's always occurring, right? So people may have a false sense that, you know, the, oh, things that happen on the blockchain uh, and that makes it like, you know, so much easier to track or things like that or harder to track. I think people are starting to realize, in fact, it's, it's more secure in many ways and uh, more traceable. Yeah, one thing I'd add to that. Yeah, sure. So uh, Judge Faruqi mentioned the KYC documents, which are required at some of the exchanges. Um, in, in some of the traditional uh, terrorism financing cases, a lot of the money is coming from the Western world. And so you know, there are uh, a lot of Hawala uh, transactions that happen, sort of an informal um, system to, to fund into certain areas of the world, but it's not easy. And so some of the traditional mechanisms are using platforms like Western Union or PayPal or some of these other facilities that also require, and everybody know, knows, require, uh, uh, likewise, know your customer documents. And so as sort of the evolution of Bitcoin since 2009, 2010, there has been sort of a sense of uh, uh, perceived anonymity um, associated with the Bitcoin. And so we would, we, you know, encountered information where um, folks and we are happy to oblige uh, sort of view Bitcoin, but some of the other uh, anonymous tokens as fully um, anonymous, which you know, as, as this has been proven is not exactly true. Even though there is some facial anonymity with the transactions uh, with alphanumeric addresses, it's not true. But compared to walking into Western Union, if you are uh, someone sitting in um, you know, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and you want to send money to a known bad guy in uh, Raqqa, Syria, and you walk into Western Union and say, hi, I'm Kyle Armstrong. Here's my driver's license. I want to send money. That uh, tends to be uh, a little less secure for these folks than something like virtual currency. Yeah, I think there's a question about 
the timing. I think I misspoke. I'm perpetually stuck in March 2020 for the rest of my life, I think. Uh, the original tweet, I believe, was January 2019. The takedown happened in um, shortly thereafter, the beginning of 2020. And then the crew has a question about the privacy coins. Kyle touched on that. And yeah, that does offer challenges. I mean, every many things within the cyber realm and just investigations in general have an evolution. They get more difficult and then, you know, we figured that out and then they pivot and do something else. And, you know, that could be a challenge moving forward, but that also poses challenges for the users too. Uh, if you, like Kyle said, these exchanges have to know their customer and know their transaction, um, that many institutions are not going to want to just take on many kinds of privacy coins if they have no way of knowing where their client's money is coming from. Uh, that's also going to be a bigger risk to them. So uh, some level of this will kind of work its way out itself as well. Yeah, one more thing to add on that point, uh, not to not to you know, regurgitate what Chris is saying, but as, as the law unfolds, the uh, uh, AML update law uh, that just came out a couple months back, uh, there are protocols and there are um, Treasury put out um, essentially uh, defining what a financial transaction is as it relates to unhosted wallets. Things like that are going to continue to unfold. Uh, the what is known as the FATF travel rule, Rule 16 of uh, the anti the the multi uh, country anti money laundering group is called the Financial Action Task Force FATF. They just get together and and sort of uh, promulgate. Uh, what they believe are going to be good anti-money laundering and counterterrorism financing laws. They uh, adopted a rule a couple of years ago about essentially having to perform know your customer on, um, on cryptocurrency. And so things like that will continue to unfold as it relates to the privacy tokens now, or the privacy coins now. Uh, you can't walk into, there's still not a level of acceptance that you can walk into um, Starbucks, or maybe you can in Starbucks, but uh, particularly places in non-Western societies and just use virtual currency. Now the protocol hasn't caught up to that yet for the transaction numbers. And so ultimately folks are going to move from the virtual currency back into fiat currency. So the difficulty for, for them, which is great for us, uh, on something like Monero, which is probably the most popular privacy token, you can't just you know, easily swap in and out of Monero. Uh, and so you definitely, there's not a lot of commerce that you can uh, engage in with Monero. You generally are gonna have to swap back into Bitcoin or fiat currency, uh, which many times is going to require an exchange. And like uh, Chris said, is you know, there's gonna be KYC there and there's gonna be risks. And so it's hard for, for folks to wanna jump in and out of those coins to just do so uh, without leaving some sort of a trail that is going to be available using uh, a litigation process. All right, so let's move on to campaign number two, Al-Qaeda. So around the same time that we were investigating Hamas, it came to our attention through Kyle that there was um, this kind of facilitator, uh, money launderer, kind of target for Al-Qaeda based in Syria, uh, specifically Idlib, Syria, and uh, crossing over the border into, I believe, Turkey. And that was really kind of how this whole investigation started. Like, here is a point of target here. Let's focus on this guy. We know he's affiliated. Let's see what he's doing with all this money. And from there, it just really kind of ballooned out. And here's a chart that uh, is kind of simplified in some sense, uh, and you don't need to follow it per se, others just to see the mass amount of overlap that we'll get into. And how this case come unfold is we started with the initial money launderer for Al Qaeda and saw that there was this overlap with what we identified five different entities the leave an impact before departure, Al Ikawa, Mahama Tactical, reminders from Syria, and Al Sadak. And uh, Mahama Tactical is obviously a kind of like a tactical, uh, like kind of mercenary. I think believe they were described as kind of like the black water of Al Qaeda. Uh, as far as like a military kind of contractor. But these other groups were portraying themselves as charitable entities. So they had mostly telegram uh, channels where you could go on there and they would have postings, they would have pictures, they had ways to communicate with them. And the pictures would be like, send money to these children, this wife, this family, we need help. 
Uh, they would show pictures of the food. And then the next one would be like, and we also like rockets. Could you send us money for this? And then you're like, hold on. That doesn't seem very charitable here. And with all the overlap between the perceived charities and also the kind of military contractors, uh, there very much was a conspiracy going on. So do you want to speak about this one and how the telegram um, sure. handles worked? Yeah, so I mean, I think one of the things is the prosecutor, right? When I was acutely aware, and you know, also just personally from my background as a Muslim American, I was like, look, um, you know, every religion has in it with the obligation to donate to charity. Uh, you know, you you want to make sure as a prosecutor that you're going after people who are willfully doing things, not unintentionally. Uh, and what you know that chart that Chris showed on the previous slide, then you see here was it was clear that these were not charitable organizations. They had no such function. In fact, far from it in their telegram channels, they were explicit. So you saw, you see here on these examples, they were literally telling you how much, um, you know, the cost was to, for different parts of military equipment in Syria and in the Al Qaeda controlled parts of Syria, how to send money. Um, and that uh, the groups had, you know, pictures of machine guns, obviously there. Uh, and these are just a, a random sampling. There was so many more that we saw. And so it was clear, you know, and I felt also personally that on the flip side is that you want to make sure that these, when people know that it, you know, someone's not acting as a charity and they're doing something illicit, um, that it's the job of those in the positions of authority to shut those down so people know they don't get tricked into, um, you know, ever donating even accidentally money there. And so here in particular, we see the, the slide, uh, picture on the slide all the way on the right. Um, it says uh, on it, uh, you know, that they're supporting the folks in uh, the Mujahideen in Syria with weapons, financial aid, and other projects assisting in the jihad. You, you know, the Bitcoin address is right there underneath it. Uh, again, you'll, you'll see that they were here using similar to the previous, it's like the campaign one, they were using a non-dynamic uh, address, which allowed uh, Chris and Kyle and the team to go ahead and, and follow the money again. And again, I think, you know, highlighting the thoughtfulness of what the prosecutors are trying to do, you know, particularly again, Jesse Brooks, uh, in particular, is that uh, we were trying to make sure that we were going, you know, following the money. You know, it's not a question of just uh, arresting people and things like that, but it is, you know, take the opportunity if you can to seize the funds uh, related to this finance scheme um, and take advantage of the fact is that basically, you know, on there, on these signs, it, it typically would say, um, you can donate anonymously, right? So you see that on this sign, there were some that even talked about in greater detail. It says, you know, Bitcoin is untraceable, so donate to us. So you have the combination of encrypted platforms like Telegram, chats, uh, and, a, and a, what was viewed by many as a privacy coin. So instead of kind of lurking in the shadows where terrorist financing previously occurred, um, this was open and notorious, as they say in law school, right? They weren't hiding it. Uh, they were just out there because they thought no one could could track what they were doing and trace the funds. And so, uh, ironically, you know, it had the opposite effect of going very overt uh, and very public in their campaign. You know, it was the GoFundMe of, for terrorism. And but they thought that basically no one would be able to catch them and just didn't understand that, um, in fact, that wasn't the case. Um, there were opportunities to seize money. I saw uh, one of our distinguished guests from what Kyle Armstrong tells me is the Harvard of Ohio, the Ohio State University, uh, Aaron Arnold, uh, a UN panel of expert, uh, asked, a, I think, a great question, uh, even as he kindly gave credit to Kyle, which I agree, that was very generous of him. But um, he said that, you know, when you seize cryptocurrencies, it's possible to use other tools uh, to seize assets overseas. One of the things I think, um, you know, Kyle touched upon was the most recent anti-money laundering law, there was a case in the DC district court that was litigated up to DC circuit that I participated in where we compelled records to be produced overseas from foreign banks. What's fascinating is the crypto system, you don't really have a lot of that because of, you know, again, the blockchain is, you know, it's this organic ecosystem. Whereas in, you know, banks and things like that, they're not really all working together per se. Here, you know, you have an exchange in South Korea, an exchange in uh, the Cayman Islands, an exchange in the United States. First of all, if one gets robbed, it does affect all of them, right? You know, I always say if a Bank of America gets robbed, it doesn't really affect Wells Fargo. Well, it does. If the largest U.S. exchange gets robbed, it, it hurts the value of cryptocurrency, uh, and it causes people to think about, like, well, how can we help that other cryptocurrency exchange? Because, frankly, we could be next. And so you, a lot of the cross-border extraterritorial issues that occur in standard fiat investigations, again, didn't occur in blockchain-based cryptocurrency because you didn't even need to send a subpoena to an overseas exchange to find out information. You could just look at the blockchain, you know, from the comfort, again, as Chris would describe in his basement as he's locked away there. Um, 
you can pull up all those, uh, you know, that information. You got a lot of cooperation. Uh, you saw in this case as well, multiple exchanges in the pleadings are identified, including overseas ones who assisted. And so, um, I think these tools in the traditional context are being expanded in for fiat investigation, but for crypto, it really comes in much less because there's a lot more cooperation uh, and you know uh, on a voluntary basis, not compelled. Yeah, so to Zia's point, uh, we obviously wanted to make sure, are these charitable organizations as maybe they're trying to say, or are they um, you know, actually the terrorist entities or facilitating terrorist entities as we are alleging? And so through the great work of HSI and their undercover platform, they said, we came up, well, why don't we just ask the guy? Let's send, ask him if we can send him some money. And so it started out very cordial of like, can I send money to support the kids? Yes. Uh, and then next thing you know, what about, can I send some money for bombs or drones? And the guy's like, nah, okay, yeah, you can send that. And in fact, if you want to get this type of drone, it's going to be very expensive. You got to do this for the bigger guns and so forth. And, uh, you know, I feel like that's pretty telling in an investigation, right? Like I've been to Goodwill, Goodwill many times in my life. And I can't ever really imagine that, that when I drop off my secondhand stuff, that they're ever going to be like, you know what, drones... Uh, and start rattling on all the details about that. Um, so that was, of course, very telling and also a great piece of evidence for us in the investigation and also another way for us to uh, kind of peer behind their public persona to see what else was going on, who else uh, we could communicate to and where the funds were going. Uh, so again, uh, we did forfeiture and warrants, uh, three hosted wallets, about 152 unhosted wallets, uh, we're part of the seizure, and uh, I don't remember the number offhand, but uh, a sizable amount of cryptocurrency was obtained and, again, uh, made useful for the Victims of Terrorism Fund. One more quick point to make. Um, so the, there were a couple questions, and one related to uh, Mr. Arnold, um, related to uh, the, the, the ecosystem and how this could have a potentially negative effect and I think there's been many uh, there's been many discussions at the Treasury Department about using some of the tools which uh, Mr. Arnold mentioned in his in his post about the U.S. basically the United States government um, taking actions against uh, financial transactions and how that might drive uh, maybe some of the illicit activity out of the U.S. financial system or in this case the virtual currency system, making it more difficult. Like, you know, is that a good policy? And for, I know for uh, DOJ and IRS and all of our, our great investigators, you know, we are focused on um, violations of federal criminal law and you know, using civil statutes to, to effectuate disruptions. And so those are conversations that are being had, of course, between the State Department, the Treasury Department, Treasuries. Um, you know, goal is to protect the U.S. financial system. So where there are, whether it be ISIS or Al Qaeda or broke nation states using U.S. dollars, uh, we believe, and I think you know, I, I wouldn't want to put words in in uh, the DOJ and in other investigators' mouths, but we believe that where the U.S. dollar or virtual currency is being used for illicit purposes, and we have an ability to effectuate some sort of a disruption that that we should. And so that's sort of uh, where we stand, or at least where my unit and uh, FBI stands, is that even though it could have uh, a negative effect and, and maybe people will look, uh, not be happy with uh, becoming public that, that Bitcoin was used for illicit purposes, you know, uh, maybe it'll drive, uh, continue to drive the illicit use out of Bitcoin or out of the US dollar, which to, to us doesn't seem like a bad thing. Yeah, I see a couple more questions. One about how to convert Bitcoin into fiat. There's a formal process that it goes through much like any other type of property. If we seize a house or car or whatever, it goes through the marshal's service and get auctioned off to the general public is generally how that happens. Uh, exchanges being cooperative from Evelyn. Yeah, I would like to point out that these investigations are on, we cannot move them forward without the help of the private sector. Uh, we speak to various regulators and um, also some of the internal investigators for the private sector for the banks or the cryptocurrency exchanges, uh, whomever. And I'd like to point out that, that without their diligence and help, 
these cases do not move forward. We need the evidence that they are holding to move the case forward. And if they sit on it for six months, obviously that could slow down our investigation. And generally they are very prompt to provide us those records, those pieces of evidence so we can analyze it and move forward with our cases. Um, you know, that back and forth that we educate each other of this is what they see on their platform. Okay, well, that makes sense. And then kind of see how that happens in the ecosystem at large. And, you know, they learn from us as we kind of uh, move these investigations along as well. So those relationships are pivotal, I think, to success. We can come back to some more questions at the end. Let's move on to campaign number three. ISIS. So this whole thing started from not since uh, Duck Hunt on Mario or on um, Nintendo has there been a better bird dog than Kyle Armstrong. He finds these things that people don't even wouldn't even believe imagine when he first brought this case. Uh, I remember telling Z and I about it. He's like, there's this case that involves cryptocurrency, ISIS and COVID fraud. And I was like, if there's Russian foreign influence involved in this thing too, it might as well just be a unicorn because there's zero chance this exists. But as always, Kyle was right. And uh, another case that's uh, I think very compelling that was ongoing about the same time as the other two, uh, we made public all at the same time. But Zia, I'll let you talk about how this case kind of began. Sure, so in 2018, Zubaydah Shanaz pled guilty to providing material support to ISIS. <clears throat> and so what that case was out of the Eastern District of New York, I, I believe, or Southern District. Um, and uh, what happened was that she laundered about $100,000 in Bitcoin. Uh, she'd gotten the funds from so stolen credit cards. So you get credit card information, you'll, and this will become relevant to the ISIS um, COVID site. Uh, once you get those stolen credit cards, you know, a way to launder it that she did, she admitted and pled, guilt, pled guilty to, um, was that she would buy Bitcoin. So she went on to trading uh, platforms and things like that, purchased a cryptocurrency. And then she sent that about $100,000 to a known alias. Uh, at the time was not known, but in the investigation led by uh, Kyle, Chris, uh, FBI, New York, as well as again, Homeland Security Investigations out of Philadelphia, uh, read by Ryan Landers. Uh, they you know, were able to figure out this is in fact was to Marat Kakar. Uh, in Turkey. And so he is a, um, as alleged in the uh, documents, he was an alleged facilit ISIS facilitator responsible for managing ISIS's hacking operations, including uh, a website called facemaskcenter.com. So we can go to the next slide. Yeah. So here's facemaskcenter.com. So sure enough, right after the COVID for, um, the COVID-19 pandemic began, um, ISIS got in the in the uh, fake PPE game, just like every other fraudster was trying to get to because they saw it was an opportunity to make some quick funds. And so uh, they launched this website, they had related Facebook pages, uh, drawing people to it. Uh, and they indicated that, um, you know, it's a very professional website. Uh, it looked like uh, they said on the about page that it, you know, it had been operating for decades and it was this like known reputable organization. They said they only used, um, you know, NIH and, uh, CDC approved PPE. They said it was all you know, N95 material, nothing less. Uh, and you know, you had uh, correspondence that's referenced in the uh, investigation where a customer in the United States contacted the website to purchase N95 masks and PPE for hospitals, nursing homes, and fire departments. Uh, in a Syrian national, there were undercover communications that were discussed afterwards, as well as uh, intercepted communications. Uh, where the Syrian national residing in Turkey responded to this request stating that they had such products for sale and they were certified by the FDA. So, you know, saying all the things that, you know, kind of think of the horrors of COVID-19 and people not having PPE, uh, that there was concerns that like, this is exactly what people were worried about is that people would send fake material uh, and send it uh, to first responders. So if you can go to the next slide, Chris. Yeah, I think uh, to emphasize one of the things that's always that we talk about in these investigations, just any type of investigation, like if the alleged bad guy worked as hard on these frauds as like a legitimate business, how successful they could be. It's really, um, you know, I guess amazing would be the word that, uh, that a terrorist organization or a facilitator of one allegedly had the wherewithal in February at the beginning of the pandemic to think of like, here is an opportunity that we can uh, further move fraud along and uh, profit from it. So, you know, the site then again, uh, 
pursuant to a seizure warrant was seized, uh, you know, after the illicit conversations and things were captured. I mean, this was what you would call in terms of law enforcement, uh, you know, light speed. It was very quick. Uh, the site was seized. Um, there were criminal charges uh, as well as, you know, in the related cases here, there was also an opportunity to try to, you know, Kyle and the folks at FBI were trying to work with their partners overseas uh, to see if they could make, a, you know, any sort of uh, law enforcement uh, based arrest or things like that uh, of the people involved in the scheme. But the most important thing right at that time was you just wanted to stop people from buying fake PPE on there. And remember, you know, they had on there the the, the PayPal, MasterCard, Visa, things like that, all the different uh, at buttons on the bottom of their page to, to pay. Uh, and you know, from the Zubayr Shanaz case, the one they got credit card information, they weren't just using that to sell fake PPE. They were also using it to get that data. So then they could go and try to, again, launder money through cryptocurrency. So it was important to, to move quickly to shut down the site. Um, you see on the bottom there, that's the website for the state-sponsored uh, victim of terrorism website uh, that talks about how people can make claims uh, if they have a judgment, as well as, um, you know, how the funds go into there. So, uh, you know, in terms of, again, as, as Chris said, it's, it was the rare case where you saw a terrorist organization moving this nimbly um, and doing something that really checked so many different uh, boxes that you, you just were almost amazed by uh, everything they were doing and how they moved so quickly. I think we saw a question, um, I'll jump to, uh, about attempting to seize from the people uh, that were sending uh, to uh, the, the, the terrorist uh, entities. And the answer is yes, as a uh, you know, Chris talked about on the slides uh, on all of the investigations where there were seizure warrants. It was both people that were donating money and you would look for willfulness again to see that they were not doing it accidentally. Um, but of the people that they were able to, you know, re really kind of show by probable cause that they thought that they knew what was going on. Uh, there was seizures of those uh, donor wallets as we'll call them. Uh, and there absolutely is a need for attribution because you can't forfeit and seize something if you don't know whose funds it is. You may be able to seize it, let me say, but you can't forfeit it. One of the things, uh, there are many decisions in this court that recently was one of Chris's cases. I worked with him on the dark scandals. It was a dark net child exploitation and hurt core site. Um, is that the judge uh, Friedrich in that case talked about how uh, notice by email, if it's reliable and verifiable, that that is a way that you can serve and it comports with due process. Uh, you know, in cryptocurrency exchanges, people are given their email addresses, right? So um, that's the primary way they're communicating. And so the judge there said in that one, uh, as like with other cases, that email notice was fine. So, uh, but you have to prove to the judge that notice was given because without that, the government cannot forfeit those funds. That is, uh, the, the court remains as the gatekeeper uh, on that. Yeah, and oddly enough, in uh, some of our cases, we've served the notice to an email address when that was all we knew. And then we received emails back of, uh, hey, I'm so-and-so, here's a picture of my identification, I'd like my money back. And the, what, what was it taken for? And like, oh, it was either part of this child exploitation or donating to terrorism. And a common answer we see is, never mind, that wasn't mine, I'm, uh, I'm good, we'll just move on. We'll just chalk it up as a, as a wash. Um, I think there's a question about, you know, why does the media, et cetera, focus on the fear or perception of cryptocurrency being used uh, for illicit when, it, when in fact it can be traced? Uh, that, that's a great question. I don't think we have the answer to. Um, we'll leave it to the Harvard Public Policy or Journalism School to, to answer that one. Um, but uh, I think that, you know, you raise a question I think people frequently have, which is why is something portrayed one way than when in fact it might be the other. But uh, look, there, you, it's demonstrably false that cryptocurrency is untraceable because this case uh, is proof that it is and that, you know, trained investigators like Kyle, Chris, uh, the HSI team uh, that they're able to use both publicly available tools, like I talked about, you know, those analytics companies out there, uh, Chainalysis, TRL Labs, Elliptic, Neutrino, there's all sorts of different ones. You know, Coinbase has one as well, I think. Um, all these different organizations provide their own tools and, you know, you'll see banks that that hire and, and use them, um, but as well as, you know, just at the end of the day, trained investigators going through and, and doing the long division on paper and they're finding it themselves. Yeah, there was one question about how much influence, um, you know, that remains to be seen. It does. We have seen in multiple instances in multiple arenas, these cases that we've been a part of uh, being brought up and used in examples for discussion and supporting policy. Um, again, of course, policy or uh, whatever else is going to be determined by those making those decisions. So we don't have any role or, um, you know, stake in that. But it is interesting when those do come up. 
I'm just going to jump in to let you know that we need to wrap this up in a few minutes so that people can make their way to our final panel on the rise of decentralized finance that's starting in a couple of minutes. So I don't know if you guys have just some closing thoughts. That was a very interesting and informative and kind of a whirlwind presentation, so. Uh, yeah, so I think I will just can close it out with our kind of final statements. So again, thank you for having us. Really appreciate it. This has been great. I look forward to checking out the other presentations as well. Um, you know, I encourage people to per look into pursuing a position in law enforcement. You Harvard grads, we are, uh, we'll give you a, a fair and equal, honest look, just like we would a quality student from Central Michigan University, for example, just a random school I picked. Um, and you could potentially find it to be a rewarding career. And we look forward to hopefully being on Team America someday. Yeah, I'll just add in, you know, I, I'm happy to be a continuing public service in uh, the government. Uh, there's a lot of different opportunities, federal public defenders, uh, prosecutors, investigators, there's all sorts of different ways. You know, these are just some of the examples that people see, you know, treasury department that you can be in public service, but there's a lot of opportunities. Um, you know, you, you have folks, obviously, uh, I think primarily your audience, a lot of folks from Harvard, but you know, wherever anyone's from, um, there's different opportunities to serve, uh, you know, Myself, I find it as to be very rewarding. This investigation is just one example of a different way that you know you get to think outside the box. Uh, you know, some things you don't necessarily get to do when you're a junior associate at a law firm. Uh, you get to fly business class, so that's pretty cool. Um, but you know, we had a lot of opportunities to do some fun stuff uh, with these cases. Uh, travel overseas, we got to go, um, you know, brief foreign partners and things like that. Um, and it was really interesting. You know, we get to see a different perspectives on how these investigations occur, um, but also a common thread of, you know, people wanted to try to do justice. And so it was uh, a, a really fun case, really. And again, at the end of the day, the, the opportunity to uh, do some undercover work was, was the most exciting of taking over the sites. And, uh, you know, it was some really groundbreaking thing. So thanks so much for having us. Kyle, anything you want to add? Yeah, thanks for having us. And uh, future uh, leaders at, at Department of Justice and uh, some of those folks, you see a lot of Harvard uh, folks that, that make their way into, um, into government. Uh, I, I think that this case, it was very fun for me, not only working with the best, uh, the best people in the US government, but the way that uh, Judge Faruqi, um, you know, take a practical look at things and a novel approach at things. And that's always uh, very fun as an investigator to be able to work with people like that and Ryan Landers up at HSI to really uh, be practical and and take a look at at the best way to do things and see if there's other ways to look at it so looking at things from a different perspective uh, goes a long way so again thanks for having thank us you. thank you, you think so those much. harvard students wear ohio state socks every day like you do kyle well maybe they should, they should. i don't know <laughs> thanks Marty. Thank we'll have so much to, to the three of you and thank you to everyone in the audience sorry that we couldn't get to all of your questions but there's a lot to be said and not enough time to say it. So happy <laughs> afternoon, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>